We have three wonderful planners with us this morning. Uh, first of all, Siobhan Craven Robbins, who's a founder and director of the National Association of Wedding Planners and has been planning weddings herself for 22 years. We've got Daisy Amodian who has established herself as the proposer and rather than dealing with wedding planning is actually dealing with the proposal and Leslie Mastin who's joining us from New York uh, who has worked in hospitality her entire life and specializing in weddings and milestone events for the last 15. So I think it would be helpful to start off if you wouldn't mind uh, perhaps starting with with Leslie just telling us a little bit about how you uh, set up the business, how it's structured, um, the sort of size team you work in, um, and the sort of clients you work with. Well, unlike Johnny and Colin, we are a small team of two. Um, it's myself and uh, Annie Rose McGrath, who's sitting in the audience, who's our production manager. Um, I come from a hospitality background, uh, was in the hotel industry for a good 15 years. Um, after the hotel industry, I actually, I, my last venue was down on um, Wall Street, at the region Wall Street. I was director of catering, um, luxury, I worked at the St. Regis, the, the Hyatt, the Hilton, um, the Regent Wall Street, kind of ho honing my skills in big and small events. And after 9-11, which is where the hotel was located, I had the opportunity to join forces with another event team and was the president of his company for 10 years. Uh, after five, after a good nine years, uh, close to ten, sorry, um, I decided that it was time to start my own business. So I'm actually kind of a, in a different situation. At my age, I started my own company just five years ago. <laughs> so um, it started with me, and Annie's been with me, and um, we, our client is the high net worth client, well-educated, cultured, well-traveled. Um, weddings that we're doing are um, in the average of $300,000 to a million, depending on the client. And um, that's fantastic. And can I ask you mm -hmm. how you charge out to clients? And is there a particular model in the U.S. that most planners use? There's, there are many models in the U.S. I would say the older model that a lot of planners are getting away from um, is what I thought gave planners and vendors um, a bad reputation as many planners started off their careers working on commissionable um, commissions from keeping low fees and working on commissions. Um, then there are other planners that charge on an hourly fee, which uh, kind of like being a lawyer. I, and then there are straight management fixed fees. Uh, and I, most recently, what we've instituted after going from fixed fees is more on a percentage basis. So we charge anywhere from 12.5 to 15 percent, depending on the scope of the event, on based on the budget, the client's budget. So reiterating what some of um, our colleagues have said earlier, setting that budget guideline down from the beginning, extremely important. Um, many times, you know, we found with fixed fees, what was happening is we would talk about a budget, they would commit to a budget, but I made the mistake of not having anything in writing. That when all of a sudden that budget went from $300,000 to $750,000 or a million dollars, I had no recourse. To, and it was very hard, as we all know, um, especially for the women in the, uh, in the room, I would say it's safe to say is to talk about money. Um, so if you don't have anything in writing to protect yourself, that's what has led me to starting to work on a percentage basis, where I'm now doing a range of, based on the budget we described, up to a certain point that it's a fixed fee, but anything over that will be a percentage of the, over, of the budget. Fantastic. And Siobhan, how about you? What, what's your setup? Um, well, I started my business 22 years ago. Um, just as Johnny alluded or mentioned earlier, 40 years ago, it's very different. Even 22 years ago, it was very different. And there weren't any wedding planners then who solely did just weddings. It would be production companies or party planners who do weddings as sort of a part of their business. 
So it was an interesting time. It was a lot of market research before I started because I wasn't sure whether I'd had this really brilliant idea or whether it was an idea that just wasn't going to work because there wasn't the market there and people had thought of it beforehand. Um, so it, it was an interesting way to start a business because you were actually coming in with an unknown product. People didn't really know what a wedding planner was. And also back in the day then, it was just classified ads in the back of You and Your Wedding and Brides magazine, and they worked. Um, again, that's just such a huge change in our industry. And very shortly afterwards, in sort of 96, 97, the advent of the internet came about, and there was one wedding website then that was started up by this chap who'd got quite a visionary approach to it, and that he limited how many people he had on the site. Um, and again, just so successful. I, I booked on average 12 weddings a year just from that website. And this changed, obviously, over the years as things have changed. Um, what hasn't really changed is my clientele. When I started out, I did actually think my clientele would largely be couples who are based abroad looking to get married in the UK. So whether they were away on contract or from the UK and working abroad but wanted to get back, married back here. Um, there's still a percentage of that clientele, but actually my clients are average London-based um, London couples getting married in London or the South East, sometimes a little bit further afield. I have ventured abroad, um, but just time short, just as um, Colin and Johnny mentioned earlier. That is really the clientele who, who are looking to book. I think the other thing that was different back in the day, which again Johnny has said, is that it was a far smaller pool, not just of suppliers, um, but also of clientele, because again, people weren't as aware of what was out there. Um, and so in some ways it was kind of easier, because you were a big fish in a small pond, mm. and the clients who did book you were clients who were prepared to spend on you, because they recognized this was a new thing, it was an upmarket thing, you had to have the budget for it. There was no quibbling back in the day, and, <laughs> and that's when I really didn't charge enough. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. I and and how do you charge? I charge a flat fee. Um, always have done, actually. I've never varied that with my business. Again, when I looked to set up, I had no kind of module to, to guide me and just looked at, okay, well, what do I need to earn? What do I want to earn? How many hours per wedding? And so I start um, at a minimum fee, uh, which is, I don't mind saying it's 15000 and then work up from there depending on the wedding. Obviously, it wasn't 15000 22 years ago. <laughs> The only thing, again, as Johnny said, um, with not being on a percentage, when you do get, I've not had a 58 million pound wedding, but when you do, you do kind of dash it. Yeah, I've had that a few times where people have had quite a considerable budget. But at the same time, just again, going back to what Johnny said, um, it's the detail in a small party and a large party. There is actually a definitive amount of work that any of you are going to do, whatever um, whether you're a photographer, a cake maker, or a planner, there's a definitive amount of work that goes into each wedding. Superb. And Daisy, you've got a huge media presence, but what size is your team and how, how's the business structured? Um, so we have an office in Soho. We have five members of staff because we've planned, I think it's just over 1,200 events now in the last six years. So we're still quite a new business. But we, like you guys, might just do 10, maybe 15 weddings a year. We do kind of between 8 and 25 events a month. So our events are very small. It's just two people, so the budgets are going to be a lot less. So our budgets start from £1,000, and they go up to 250 grand. So we price it very differently. So if someone comes in with 250 grand, we'll probably charge 125 to 15%, exactly like Leslie said. Um, if they come in with £2,000, we're going to charge pretty much 50%. And we can do that because uh, we've got lots of suppliers that we get cheaper rates with. We have a storage facility in Clapham that's really near our office here. Um, and we already have all the props, everything that you could possibly imagine. So these guys kind of give us a week to two weeks turnaround. They get the ring, they panic because they don't know what to do. They want a really nice story. So we have to pull it out of the bag in like two weeks is our average turnaround time. So we've already got the venues, we've already got like lots of photographers, we've already got the props so we can kind of turn and burn. Fantastic. And working with the, the right suppliers is obviously key. Um, Leslie, there's a lot of venues and, and suppliers here today. Mm -hmm. Should they be approaching planners? They all want to work with the, the top planners. Should they be approaching them, or would you always go out and choose your own suppliers? 
You know, I, I, no, I would never say to not approach uh, planners. Some days we may be more abrupt than others and say, and, and other annoying me, but you know what? You never know when your timing is. And there's a, there's a particular photographer we just started working. He was persistent, and finally I was just like, okay, I have to meet him. He was eager to work with us. Obviously, somebody that's eager to work with us also is going to, we assume, be a little bit more reasonably priced if we're trying to keep budget cuts down in certain areas. Um, as far as vendor, my approach with vendors, uh, every, every, every party planner has their favorites, and, that, and I'm no different. Um, however, with that said, I think that what keeps you relevant in this industry and fresh is that you are open to always meeting and working with new vendors because you know there are certain and everybody has people that they follow on instagram that you can say oh yeah he was her designer again oh yeah he was like i think people become complacent and um they take things for granted and i just i like to mix it up i never very rarely will you look at an instagram that i've used the same designer for every wedding in the last month Maybe I use him twice a year, and the same with lighting, photography, and video. Mm. So do you feel it's, it's more important to be looking for the new talents and perhaps taking a little bit of a risk, or are you more comfortable protecting your reputation by, by using the tried and trusted? It's twofold, trusted. but I mean, I'll use an example of a wedding we did last June that was published um, spring in Inside Weddings. Um, the client had an unrealistic budget. Of course, that budget grew, but that's another story. Um, and I, I had to figure out how to be creative. And I took a leap of faith with a designer that I saw was up and coming. Um, I, I definitely knew her and felt comfortable, but I knew it was a big job for her. And she did an amazing job. And she has gotten so much press from it and, so, and has used the wedding so many times on all her, the press things that she does that um, I'm a pretty, I have good gut. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I haven't been disappointed yet when I've taken a chance on somebody. Good, good. And suppliers of venues can come in and out of fashion. Is there a danger that you as a brand could go out of fashion? Well, the one thing I don't have going for me is my age. <laughs> I mean, it's a fact of life. Uh, I've been doing this for well over 30 years. I'm 60 years old, proud to admit it. But, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I think you have to, from, in, from my perspective, I have to keep current. It's important to know fashion, music, everything that's new, vendors. It's also important for me to keep myself around, surrounded by young people. Annie, does, Annie keeps me young, you know, and, you know, the reality of it is when we go on bridal appointments, the mothers love me, the daughters like me very much, don't misunderstand me, but they're going to connect with Annie, and it's a good, you know, the yin and the yang, we, we balance each other out well, and, and, and that's what I find with most people in this room. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And we're all, we're all looking at enhancing our client base today. So how do you identify the, the better clients? You know, I, when people, our, our process is, all of our business is through referrals. We don't advertise, um, so our referrals can be, come in three different ways. Uh, what I call a legacy client, we're doing um, a client's, this is now a 10th event for us, it's her 55th birthday. Others are venues. That's very common in New York. I don't know if it's the same here. If somebody, if a client walks into the Pierre and they haven't, they haven't, um, they haven't had a planner yet, it, my name will come up along with others as well. And um, and then vendors, which go. I go back to the vendors is to have good relationships with your vendors. So many times when people don't think they need a planner and they um, are going to do it on their own and they're going to go and meet a photographer, they're going to go to the Pierre and they say, you know, your name came up in three different interviews. So that's, that's you know, they're selling for us too. Um, what was the question? <laughs> sorry, I went off on a tangent. I'm sorry about that. So identifying the right brides and perhaps oh. also identifying the tricky brides yeah. and the ones to steer clear of. That's always a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, I have tried to turn around my interviewing process that I'm interviewing them now for the first call. Um, so I know that I'm, they're right. They, they can figure out if I'm the right one for them and they're the right one for me. Um, there's a lot of trigger points. I think you're probably leading into the fact that we, I also am friendly with my competition. And there's a core group of us that have, I would say every other morning we have coffee chats 
or we have text chains, and we compare notes. New York, I'm sure London isn't that much different, is a very small world. So we know when client is, um, is shopping, and we compare mm -hmm. notes, we talk about it. Um, sometimes we even refer each other business if we know it's not the right client, or they, you know, their fees are different than mine. Um, we get ideas for new vendors. So there's a lot of ways in New York you can find out if someone's a problem client. Um, <laughs> and then, you're, then your decision is if you're going to walk away from it or not. Yeah. Great. And Siobhan, you advise a lot of new planners coming into the industry. If you have the experienced planners perhaps passing on a particular bride, would you encourage a new planner to actually take on that bride if it means that they can launch their career? I think that's a really difficult one. And I think, just as Leslie said, to trust your gut, gut on that. I think you'd know when you're ready for that. And I think that's one of the most important things. I know today we're talking about the ideal client. It's also, are you ready for that ideal client? Who is your ideal client? Is your business set up and ready? Are you ready for them? Are you, are you sort of mentally prepared for that? Are you charging correctly? Because all of that then gives you the confidence. If that's all in place, then you may well decide to go from it. Also, as a new, um, a new planner, you may not identify them certainly I didn't in the early days you know there were, there were quite a few nutters that slipped through the net over time and uh, you certainly get more savvy as um, it's a good nine I'm nine years clean of a nutty bride so, yeah. you're lucky yeah. so did you spend time actually defining who your audience is so that you knew exactly where the good fits were going to be? I'd, I'd say I did. Obviously, it was different because it was so new then. Um, so your, your market was really anybody who was intrigued by it and sort of got the, what you were doing, that <coughs> you were going to be um, a value to their wedding, that they couldn't do it without, without your help. Um, so I'd say I did, but I think that's really maybe something I've more revisited over time, I think you constantly have to look at that and as your business develops as well. And I think that um, it, it's the whole thing of, again, coming back, I think it was John who said of it, the quality over quantity. You know, in the early days, you, you can't charge what you're going to be charging in 10 years' time, but nevertheless, you can go into the market where you should, you know, at a, a price that's worth it. Nobody wants to be working for a salary or the, the four grand a year, as Johnny said when he started. Everybody's been there, but you, you've got to have a point that it's, it's developing. You've got to have that two-year rule, as you'd have with any business, that if by then you're not seeing it do this, you, you've just got to either readdress it or wash your hands of it. It's, it's just not right. And some of that could be missing your market. So I think it's important to always revisit that, actually, and the ways to, to target them, which has just tr changed exponentially over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've built up a big network of, of connections. For somebody starting out fairly new into the business or perhaps going into more of a niche part of the market, how would you advise them to build that network and how important have you found that to you? Um, well, I think just again, as Leslie said, it, it is about um, working with different suppliers and also looking for new suppliers as well. Um, I'm in the fortunate position, having done it so long now, people approach me, which, which is great. And I will always look at every email provided is addressed to me rather than a hi there or to whom it may concern. We really want to work with your business filled in um, <laughs> because that doesn't smack of somebody who's really done their research and wants to work with or me. Or misspelled your name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's, it's so simple just to look those things up. So um, it, it is important to, to keep researching. And I think, yeah, there's, there's various ways, obviously networking, effective networking, which is part of what we do with NAWP, um, and also getting to know different suppliers. What Colin said earlier about um, weddings being teamwork and collaboration, he was talking really about his team, but actually it goes outside of that, doesn't it? All of you are part of a team that works on a wedding, so you can all refer to each other. And just as Leslie said now about how um, that client heard her name from three different sources, you, you can never quite know where the next client's going to come from. And that client may be a little bit further down the line. They may have got to see their photographer because maybe photography is top of their list and suddenly sort of saying to this photographer, gosh, do you know a good cake maker? Do you know a good florist? Do you know a good stationer? And that photographer's going to say, well, actually, I worked with this planner recently. She was great, and I think that's probably what you need to do. Yep, superb. So that's always going to help that word of mouth. It reinforces it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And any other advice you would give to somebody starting out in the planning business or trying to step up a level? Mm -hmm. I think, um, just as I said a minute ago about 
identifying that ideal client. As I say, today's all about striving for them, but it's um, are you ready for them as well? Make sure everything is set up. And it also comes back to um, what Johnny said about discussing price. You know, you can be so nervous about, almost apologetic about that in the early days. But actually, it's a part of that questionnaire. You need to know their date. You're not going to go ahead and see them for a consultation, not doing, knowing when their wedding is, because you may not be able to do it. It's just the same with the budget. Um, same with where they're getting married. If it's out of your area, if it's, I don't know, in Marrakesh, and you've never done anything in Marrakesh, you're going to say, no to that wedding. So it, it's really, really important to establish that from the outset and have the confidence in that too. Um, and yeah, I think that's the thing that to, to ensure you're ready and then it's almost like that, that client will start coming your way as well. And again, coming back to what Johnny said about turning business down, a really brave thing to do, but he, he perpetuated a myth really of what his business was because it didn't exist at that point, but it, it created an intrigue about it. So, so don't do it before you're ready, you will get caught short. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Daisy, talking about turning business down, you've dealt with 1,200 proposals mm -hmm. and you're not tempted to then do their weddings. They love what you do. Surely they're, they're keen to then work with you for planning their wedding too. Yeah, it was a difficult decision to not plan their weddings because obviously it's the, we've just done the biggest thing in their life. They're not married and most of them don't have kids. And so it's such a personalised thing. They absolutely love us and we get invited to their engagement dues and their weddings. We've been flown abroad to their weddings and they become our friends. But I just always wanted to stay true to the brand. The brand is the proposers. We plan marriage proposals. So I don't want to pretend that I'm something that I'm not. And so that's why we focus on that and we do turn them down. Fantastic. I've I suspect there's a few planners here tonight who'll be plying you with cocktails to help your database later. Um, and you've, you've built your business very much on uh, PR, and I know we're going to be hearing from you um, tomorrow for one of the sessions. Um, would you do a celebrity wedding for free if you were going to get the good PR out of it? Celebrity proposal for free. Uh, sorry, celebrity <laughs> proposal. Um, yes, absolutely I would do it for free. Only if in writing mm -hmm. that they said that they were going to do the social media for free. So I would check how many um, Instagram followers <coughs> they had for starters. I mean, we have done a few celebrity ones um, for free and we did get quite a few followers from it. So um, we were just kind of testing it out. But we actually contact celebs sometimes. So we see them in the press. The press are always talking about who's going to get engaged. And we're such a kind of modern business and guys don't know we exist. Proposal planning isn't really a thing yet. So they don't know about us. So the one way that, well, not one way, because we're in a lot of press, but um, Instagram is key. And um, we just send them a little private message. Hey, thinking about popping the question soon. We're here when you need us. And quite a lot of the times they do reply, and that's how we got two of them through there. Um, and they just laugh. They're just like, oh my god, I didn't know this exists. Okay, well, I'll get in touch. So hopefully some big ones will get in touch one day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's actually getting to know your customers before they've even approached you, and you're, you're then brave enough to go out and, and contact them. Superb. Yeah, why not? Why not? Superb. And have celebrity proposals on Instagram yeah. made a difference to how elaborate proposals are getting mm. and how much people are prepared to spend on, on having that amazing experience that's going to be Instagram worthy? Mm. I can't tell you how many calls I've had for the Holly Valance proposal with the private islands and Marry Me in Fire and the Kim Kardashian proposal with the orchestra and the baseball field. And I'm like, what's your budget? £200. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we get 30 calls a week and 10 of them have £200. So they just don't understand the value of money and I'm sure everyone gets that. Um, but the other guys, I mean, two and a half grand to five grand is what an average person would spend. And that's a lot of money to them. So they're expecting quite a lot for it. And that's why we do the deals with venues and suppliers and stuff. So they do get a good deal. And, and also every single one of their friends is also getting engaged. So it's all about word of mouth and people come back. And actually, we got a girl in the audience and she knew she was going to, I was going to say. But um, yeah, I did her proposal. And I did not know she was coming here and I haven't seen her for five years. So, um, yeah. Aww. Aww. <laughs> so grooms don't have much of an idea on what they should spend. Do they come with you? Is it always a ridiculously, slow, ridiculously low budget? Or do some come with incredibly high budgets and it's then a challenge for how do I spend this on two people? Most guys that want to spend under 10 grand will never admit what their budget is and you've got to kind of give them examples. But the people that want to spend 250 grand, I mean one guy literally said to me straight away before I even said a word, 
that I don't mind spending 500,000, but I don't want to spend a million. And that's what he said to me. And I was like, are you legit? I don't know. There's a lot of giggling. And then I ended up flying to Dubai to meet him, and he did want to spend a million pound. But honestly, I didn't know how to spend a million pound for two people. So it was really difficult. I was trying to like hire celebs. I wrote a script for Jamie Foxx, who agreed to be a part of it. In the end, we had Arnold Schwarzenegger in there. But um, yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a challenge I think we all want to, to have. And I think with, with Pinterest in particular, people see these amazing images and, and they want it and there's no pricing on there, they've got no idea. Um, do you have guidance on your website? How do you let these grooms that really do have no idea um, get, get a bit of an impression of what they can get? So 50% of the guys will have an idea, um, but they don't know how to do it and they're with the girl, so they can't possibly arrange all this stuff with her being there, and they're panicking anyway, so we kind of take that stress from them. And the other guys don't have a creative bone in their body, they'll freely admit it. Um, they're useless, the girl wants a story, everyone wants a story, they want that shot, or, you know, they want the great, they just want something special that they can tell their grandkids, so um, we find out all about them, what makes them tick, why they love each other, where they first kiss, what's her favourite colour, favourite film. We stalk her over everything. <laughs> we try and get like pictures, because you know what people are like when you've seen their picture. Um, and then we create ideas based on them. And if you've got a really good idea of, of who the bride is and what she's about, and the groom then comes off with a really unrealistic idea of either budget to create what you're going to need, or an unrealistic idea of what she might like, mm. how do you deal with that? How much would you guide him and how much would you let it be his proposal? Well, some guys just really want it to be about them, and it's not just about them, and I will tell them that. So um, we had a proposal in Covent Garden, and there was a thousand people watching. There was 40 dancers in a flash mob, and he said he could dance like Michael Jackson. He had to, he had to be the dancer, so we just believed him and said, OK. So he jumped in the crowd, and she's like, what are you doing? And he's dancing, and it was really, I mean, it was fun, uh, and everyone was clapping and was loving it. And then they pulled her into the crowd, and confetti went up, and he proposed she said yes then she ran off and we were like oh my god she said yes but what's happening so I ran over to her and checked she was okay and she was just so overwhelmed and having known her because we've then planned um, their anniversary and they were the ones that flew us to Dubai for their wedding I know her very well she's the most timid quiet person ever that is the worst proposal for her <laughs> she want, I know that she wouldn't want that now so it's like if, we'd, if he'd let us be a part of that then we could have changed it, but he was adamant it was about him, so we, won't, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And I guess the same applies for anyone here, that actually it's remembering that it's about the couple. Mm. It's not just about what he's wanting for his proposal. It's, it's about the, their story together. Thank you very much indeed, Leslie, Siobhan, and Daisy. I think we've got time for a few questions, perhaps? Yes, we do. Yes. Would anyone like to ask the panel any questions? Daisy, I'm quite interested to know, are you seeing it changing in terms of who is doing the proposal? I mean, you, you talk about it with the group mm -hmm. getting in touch. Seeing any sort of, you know, yeah, so women? Or... <laughs> <laughs> we wish. <laughs> um, we've done six proposals from a woman to a woman and one proposal from a woman to a man. And we do get inquiries from women to men, but they never do it. They never go ahead. Just think they're nervous. But it's leap year. Uh, well, we did one for leap year. And it was in the middle of Piccadilly Circus, all up on the screens. And he said yes, but he was, he was embarrassed. So I just hope that... More women can do it. It's, it's just not a thing at the moment. It should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, to move on from that, are you seeing a change in terms of the ages who are getting engaged? Do you think that's reasonable? No, it's all ages. We've had like 60 year olds. We've had re-proposals where they've just done something so awful like 20 years ago or 40 years ago and they want it and they've just been ridiculed at every dinner at the party ever since and so they really pull it out of the bag Aww. and now they've got money to actually do something special. So That's nice. That's a nice idea. Yeah. The, the mic can come down actually. I, I think I okay. um, So I have a question for the players. What would you say is a per the, the percentage of weddings that you're now doing that are destination versus um, in couples I have a small percentage. I would say 75, 85. But we're the triangle: New York, Palm Beach, East Hampton. Some, some in the islands. So I don't do that much international. 25%. Um, um, I, I don't do as many weddings now because of um, heading up NAWP. But um, back in the years that I was doing, on average, 15 a year. 
probably one a year would be abroad. I think that's on the increase, though, now. I don't think that's representative of how it is now. And um, particularly with the weak pound, I think um, a lot of European destinations are becoming more popular. Um, but um, it, it, they've always existed. Um, it's, but I think there's an increase now in, in the appeal. And I think already here there's some ve um, European venues here, which, which is great. Um, it's, it's more accessible to people now, definitely. Who else was it? Andrew? It's going to be Andrew with a difficult one. <laughs> when I started my business, which is Bloomsbury Films, 12 years ago, there weren't that many videographers, and neither for that matter were there many planners. In fact, there weren't that many venues or many of anything. Because what I've seen over 12 years is a proliferation of venues, of planners, of suppliers. And what I'd like to know from the panel is what, it, you know, particularly Cheval maybe, what are you doing now that you weren't doing 22 years ago to keep a pace with the changing, you know, well, I think saturation in the market? What, you know, what, what, what's, uh, how are you it, offsetting that? It is, it's really difficult. Just as I said, um, when I started, it was a much, much smaller pool, and, but also the clientele was smaller. And also, people kind of knew what they were going to spend. I think there's a huge disparity in that now of what people expect to spend. So they think they can get a photographer for £500 who's going to be as good as a photographer who charges from £3,000. We know it's just not the case. But I sometimes feel you're fighting a losing battle in sort of educating them on that. I think the biggest change now obviously is the advent of social media and the internet but moreover social media and obviously it's really really key to be on that um, I think the advantage of it is is you now actually can constantly put out images of your work and obviously we're in a visual business so I think that's massively advantageous to us if I go back to the day where I used to be waiting for a bi-monthly wedding magazine to come out before anything would be published you don't have that now you, you're your own editor aren't you of your work um, but I don't think it's the be-all and end-all either. Um, and it's, a very, it's always been a, um, a fine balance in our market of we're obviously selling a, a product, but we can never really be seen to sell. We can never be too pushy. Mm -hmm. It's about, as Colin said, seducing that client, sending them away thinking they can't do without you. And I think that's even more important now, and that's a message that should, should have come across in your advertising, your social media, your, your website. And I think that's the change that perhaps then is setting you as we said about the cream rising to the top instead of the scum. And, and Daisy, if there was another proposal company setting up or proliferation of those in a few years' time, what would you be doing? Sorry, can you repeat that? I if there was a proliferation of proposal companies, because you might well imagine in five years' time there'll be others, what, you know, what do you think you'll be doing now well, to head that off? Well, I was to do it, but there's actually 60 companies and they're all in, in America. Mm. <laughs> so okay. I've got the rest of the world, pretty much. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there is, there's, there is competition, but actually we're friends with quite a lot of the people in America and we send each other business, so nice. yeah. mm. it's a nice That's industry to be in. Okay. Sorry. Hi. I think there's no traditions anymore or traditions are starting to die. I mean, I'm definitely seeing more and more where the groom's family is paying for the band or paying for the brunch and maybe something else or participating. We also have a lot of very successful couples that are paying for their own wedding. I'm, I'm dealing more and more with directly the bride and groom, or the parents have just said, this is the money you have to spend, you plan your own wedding. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's the bride pays for everything like it used to be. I don't think it's ever been like that for me. Um, the majority have always been the couple paying for themselves, and it's when I go back to where I thought sort of the market would be the clients who were based overseas and getting married back here. I think my couples have always been sort of early 30s, you know, obviously below that and above that, but on if you took an average and paying it for it themselves with some contribution from parents. Having said that, when it's been the really bigger budgets, you know, the seven-figure weddings, it's generally been the parents paying. <laughs> Hi there. Um, with regards to suppliers and wedding planners, um, of course, we have so many great hotels here, uh, and we, want, we all want to reach you and showcase our products. And we either by cold calling, sending an email, 
uh, or coming to these beautiful exhibitions. Um, I understand your time is valuable, so it's ours, but we want the best way to reach you and be able Fam to share. Fam trips are always good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that. Especially in Mykonos, right? I understand. Um, what is the, you believe the best or smoothest possible way for, surpri for suppliers to reach such renowned wedding planners like yourselves? That is very uh, uh, time effective and we don't become annoying to you. <laughs> I, I just, I honestly, I just, uh, persistence from your end, I suppose, is the answer. You're going to get a lot of closed doors and a lot of brief phone calls because it depends on our schedules and busy, you know, busy time. Um, I think you just have to be persistent and it's just, you never know. It's that one day that you call that you, it was your lucky day because that's happened many times for me. Um, I, I don't know really how else to guide you on, I think on that. We're always looking for something new, and so I, I for one, always appreciate people contacting me, um, and particularly if they've researched me and can see their product or their venue matches the style of weddings that I do. So actually, I will always get back to you, mm -hmm. but it may be that actually I can't see you till sort of between November and February, which is sort of typically when we've got more time to go out, meet people, and see places. But but definitely always to contact us, never to be shy of us. It's a symbiotic relationship we need you like you need us you know th th there's no hierarchy in this at all um, and so I think you've got to keep that in mind um, with fam trips a great idea and wouldn't it be lovely we could probably go on one a week if we had the time but we don't um, so I think two key things there are that um, for, for a planner to go on a fam trip it's got to pique their interest so again you've done your homework you've seen actually this will interest them there's, there's no point sending me a venue in Italy when I don't do destination weddings lovely as it would be to go to Italy I don't have the time and I'd be wasting your time so that's essential to make sure you've matched and it would be something that piques their interest. The other reason I will go is if somewhere's had a refurb or a change. There's, there's quite a radical difference and I think I really do need to go there. Um, I will go and see it. And I think also really, really key to showcase what's different about your venue. So it's lovely just to go for a lunch somewhere, but it is another lunch somewhere. Um, showcase the other elements you can bring into it, whatever that is, whether it's the surround, the situation that it's in, the things that you can work into a wedding experience Experience, whether it's a wine tasting, um, a day at the beach, a picnic out in the desert, whatever it is, because all of that helps us build a picture of what the opportunity is. It's not just that venue, and they do a great lunch. And if I may add quickly, Melina, where is Melina sitting, who hosted a fam trip to Aspen, I thought was so well done because it was in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce. So it was three different hotels that were showcasing and how they work together and there were different places that you could do exactly what you described be in see the whole feel the, the whole vibe for a weekend wedding so that worked out very nicely i know you know and is it a challenge for you um for these fam trips of getting the balance right of talking on your social media about where you are and what you're doing but also letting other people then know about this amazing place you've just found do you actually have to keep a little bit quiet about your doing what you're doing no, I don't think no, they would I like don't. it if we were very quiet about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's what's so I, I would, it. yeah, mm. good, good. Any more? I think that concludes um, the session. Thank you very, very much, ladies. <laughs>